so. Oh, I don't know. Maybe I need assistance with that. Ja, sehr verehrte Damen und Herren, herzlich willkommen hier am Open Forum 2000. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Open Forum 2010 in Davos. We have quite an exciting panel here, and the title of our discussion is Yes, We Can, but it comes with a question mark. We remember the election campaign of um, Barack Obama. The slogan was Yes, We Can, and the belief that there was a possibility of change which electrified not only the United States but the whole of the world. And we remember as well January uh, 2010, uh, 2009 when he took the world stage as the first black president of the United States. He bears upon his shoulders the hopes and expectations of the whole world. And our question today is what's happened after a year? There is disappointment, perhaps. What's the reason for that? How do things stand one year on? Uh, to what extent uh, has the financial and economic crisis in the US been overcome? What's the relationship of the US and the Arab countries? To what extent has the international climate policy changed to reflect the new position of the US? And then we also want to talk about the question of human rights. And after we've discussed those questions with the panelists, obviously the floor will be open to you uh, to um, participate in our discussion. Allow me to present our guest today, Riz Khan, who is uh, the anchor of Al Jazeera in Washington. So please welcome him with a large, warm round of applause. Riz Khan, welcome. Then uh, right at the end, Susan M. Collins from Maine. She's a member of the Republican Party. She is one of the key players, I've been told, in the Senate. So please give her a warm welcome. And perhaps I should uh, say now that you will have to leave us 15 minutes early uh, because you already booked into another panel. So it doesn't mean anything about um, what's been said here if uh, the, sen the senator gets up and leaves us before the end. Allow me also to introduce Martin Sorrell, the uh, group chief executive of WPP, the um, largest holding of the world. A warm welcome to him. And then Ulrika Lunacek, the member of the European Parliament, uh, speaker of the European Green Party, and uh, uh, someone with great experience in foreign relations and foreign policy. Welcome. Ken Roth, Executive Director, Human Rights Watch, USA. And a uh, warm welcome to you too as well. So, to start with, allow me to ask you for a personal comment about how you evaluate the president and his work after a year. Um, maybe, Riz, you could tell me about um, what you think has happened over the last year. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for inviting me on the panel. Um, it's interesting because I'm still a British citizen living in, in America as a British citizen, so I'm not really close to American politics as such. But it's interesting, uh, the mood change that occurred when uh, Barack Obama was elected. And it could be that any country where there's been a, a leadership for you know, any, any length of time, eight, 10 years, wherever, um, can create that sense of wanting change. But there was certainly a, a, a very palpable change in America. I, I feel sorry for Barack Obama because I think his campaign should have been, yes, we can if we have enough time and political freedom. Because <laughs> Any, uh, it's true, any, any, um, anyone wanting to enact major change in, in politics in a country like America or in Britain where I grew up um, is very much tied down, very manacled. Um, and the thing with, uh, I always think of politics as, as medicine. Uh, you have surgery or you have, uh, you know, d like drug therapy. Now drug therapy takes a lot longer and it takes a lot of patience and people don't often have the patience for drug therapy. They want surgery. But there's no politician who's going to pull out the knife and, and start cutting out things. They just can't do it. So I think for Barack Obama, he has the challenge of trying to change so much 
uh, at least th th that he would like to change, without the freedom to do it. So it's, it's very early. Uh, people have expectations, very high expectations, at too early das heißt, a stage. Das, das heißt so what you're saying is you're, you're not really surprised at how things have turned out if you look at uh, the political circumstances because he's had to deal with the whole political process. Yeah, not at all. I think what, you know, it's very difficult for, uh, for anyone um, when, when there's been eight years of a government that has worked a certain way to come in and try to change things. Um, there really isn't a lot that people can change. And I think uh, to some degree people saw that in Britain. The Labour Party didn't completely reverse things when, when Tony Blair came in, again, to a huge sort of uh, accolade. Um, you think so? <laughs> <laughs> third way, third way. Third but yeah, but the thing is, it was still what people considered a left, uh, centre left, as opposed well, to I, left. I left. think. Uh, yeah. Can I? Yeah, 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 sure. I think I think that's um, an interesting observation because you know, Barack Obama may have tried too fast. But I, can I come back to the? It's too soon. Mm -hmm. It's too soon. The guy's only been there for one year. He has four years at least to go, or three more years to go. Um, we happen to be here one year after the event, and so, and we have this program and we have this event, so we're being asked to, for media purposes, I would suggest, to, to, to give a view as to what he's done and what he's not done. I, I, I do think that I went to the inauguration, and uh, it was an amazing event, and uh, I'm now 64. And it took me back to 1960, when I was just coming out. I was at university. And we all know, everybody in this room knows where they were on the night or the day that uh, Kennedy was assassinated, President Kennedy was assassinated. And it reminded me very much of those days. And uh, I think about the reasons why uh, President Obama was elected, obviously, first black president, uh, uh, an awe-inspiring event, particularly for younger people. Uh, when Kennedy was elected, similar, similar impact on me as a, a young, a young uh, undergraduate. And in, in a, you know, Barack Obama looked good, but he looked so good because of what we thought about President Bush in the previous eight years. <laughs> and or, or when I say we, I would say what people thought about President Bush over the, pre the previous eight years. And it reminded me of what you, what you thought about Nixon in response, in, in, in comparison to Kennedy. Again, Kennedy looked good. It, the margin of victory was nowhere near. In fact, it was quite marginal victory in 1960 uh, between Kennedy and Nixon. But it was really also because of the negatives about Kennedy, uh, Nixon, negatives about Nixon. Um, I think it is too soon, but I would say that our level of expectation was so high <laughs> in January at the inauguration so high amongst young people, so high amongst middle-aged people and even older people about what he could do. And he'd come in on such a wave of uh, emotional sympathy that I think it was almost too, too much to expect that he could make an impact at this point in time. Now, having said all that, I think it's reached a very important stage. Um, see, about see personally have any uh, expectations to expect? Yeah. Well, I, I think the, the big issue is whether President Obama is a, a pragmatist or an ideologue. Is he a Jimmy Carter or is he a Clinton or a senior Bush or a junior Bush? And I, and I, mean, that, I mean that in the sense that the electorate have clearly spoken in these elections and will speak again in November about how they feel he is doing, soon or not. And he may have gone too far, and that's why I pick up on Riz's point about the Labour Party. I mean, Tony Blair uh, developed a third way, a new Labour Party, in the same way as the Conservatives now under Cameron are trying to develop a new way, a, th a third way of their own sort. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's going to be fascinating to see how President Obama, he's learning on the job. He never had the job before. Somebody, oh, said, somebody, said, somebody said a few weeks ago, the American presidency is the only job in America where you learn on the job. He hasn't, he hasn't put into place all the people that he has to put into place in the administration. In fact, I think it's true to say that Senator will say whether this is true or not, that he has less people in place after a year than President Bush had and other presidents had. So he hasn't got all his people in place. 
So he's understaffed and he's dealing with all these issues that are hitting him, the economy, the banks, climate change, trade, protectionism, US-China relations. So, so this is a heavy agenda. Anyway. Aber Sie sind professional in PR and image and whatever. What, what would you, you advise you, you're him? You're trying to put me down. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. But uh, if you had the chance to get to him and, uh, and tell him, look, your image really suffered a lot and um, you have to change. Now you have to change a little bit. What would it be to be harder, to be, um, to talk less and act more, whatever, I don't know. I ask you, uh, what is... For, probably for me to say somebody should talk less. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, I really do think he has to make some choices. Um, I really do think he has to make some decisions. I think, you know, he has made some brilliant speeches. I, I, I don't think, I don't know who writes his speeches. Uh, I don't know who develops it. He obviously has a big... It, the speeches are as good as we saw from Kennedy. Good. I mean, Ted Sorensen, I think, uh, did uh, partly did the inauguration speech, who wrote a lot of uh, Kennedy speeches. And um, I, so I, I think it is take action, and I think he has to be more pragmatic. Pragmatic. I think he has to move to the center more. And just one point: what fascinates me about democracy, fascinates me, is that the American electorate took away his one Senate vote that would have given him the filibuster control. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. That brings me to you, um, Senator. I started. Yeah. <laughs> yes, what a surprise. Yes. You must be actually very happy about what happened during this year because he came as the president of change. He promised a lot. And now he lost that seat in Massachusetts, which is really hard for him and his party. And this gives you and um, your party really the opportunity to block everything <laughs> um, well, wait, in wait, the Congress. Wait. Actually, There's you must be happy. Tell us about no, the truth. but I think you're operating under a complete misconception. Uh, first of all, first of all, I'm a New England moderate Republican. I don't want gridlock. I want us to solve problems and get things done. I like the president on a personal level. I think he's made some serious mistakes during the past Which? year. The slogan, yes, we can. The emphasis should have been on the word we. Instead, the president chose to govern from the left. I do agree that he needs to move to the center. Most Americans are not left or right. Most Americans are in the center. That doesn't mean that the Congress, the congressional representatives and senators are in the center, but the nation is in the center. And I believe the president made two mistakes in his first year. And I say this as someone who was one of only three Republicans to vote for his economic stimulus package. So without my vote, as my Republican colleagues remind me, that package would not have passed. So I end the year disappointed in the president because I believe that he made two <coughs> mistakes. One, he moved too far to the left. And two, he should have focused like a laser on the economy the first year. All these other issues are critical, health care reform, climate change, they're issues I believe in. There are issues that need attention. But this president was confronted with a deep recession and two wars, and those should have been his focus for the first year. He's challenged because they say Obama stands for originally born African managing America. So immediately he's at a disadvantage, I think, for some people there. I've never heard that. <laughs> Stunt, ever. You want to hear again? Well, I'd like to begin in Germany. There's a wonderful sentence. I'll leave it to the interpreters to uh, translate, um, which was around at the beginning of the Obama campaign and the inauguration, um, which every 
every beginning has an enchantment, carries enchantment in it, carries, brings a spell, if you like. And it, it really cast a spell over not only the United States, States, but the whole of the world. Now, the question is, what happens with this spell? Because there was a real hope, trust, a belief in the possibility that another world was possible. What can be done now with that hope? After every revolution, however it comes, and this election was in some form a revolution, even if some people don't like this work, but after every revolution, you, there come the efforts of recognizing that things weren't perhaps as radical as one has hoped. Because Obama is only part of the system, a system with Congress, with Senate, and other key players as well. So he has power, there's no doubt about that. But how can he bring that power to bear? And I think that this second year will show the possibility that he can put things into practice. Then he started, he started, I think, with his State of the Union speech uh, two days ago. Uh, it was a start in that direction, uh, trying to really focus on what the people in the US need, which is jobs. I hope he will go in the direction of green jobs, because that is what is sustainable. But that is something that he still needs to develop. And he needs to find a way of how to tackle those, now with the, the loss of the, of the 60 seats in the Senate, uh, how to get things through. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. will be his big challenge in this long way to go for yeah. the next I three years. Yeah. Let, me, let, me Ken, Ken let, me, let me try to step in here for a second. First of all, only in America is it considered governing from the left to pursue the audacious view, the crazy view, that everybody should have the right to health care. Can you imagine that? What kind of crazy radical idea is that that everybody should have the right to be have taken care of when they get sick? That's governing from the left? You know, only in America. And the idea... <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and the idea that, that it's somehow wrong for him to do this in the first year. When the guy's not dumb, I mean, he knows that come November, he's going to lose some seats in the Senate and the House. That happens always in the midterm election. So he's trying to push his agenda through during the first year when he has maximum power. And, and you know, unfortunately, that, that first two-year window has closed more quickly than expected because of the Massachusetts election. But he was trying to get everything done that he could while he has the capacity to do it before this view takes hold that it's a crazy radical idea to seek health care or to, to try to control climate change, um, as well as dealing with the economy and jobs and so forth. So, so you know, that's what he's trying to do, and it is a lot. Now, you know, that's, that's speaking um, in his defense. I have to say I have problems with what he has done as well. I mean, as, as Martin suggested, this is, you know, by far and away the most eloquent president we have had since Kennedy. And, and so, you know, as you would expect, he has given a series of brilliant speeches. Um, and he's <laughs> gone around the world and really talked about his vision. Um, and he's done it in a very tailored way. He talks about the local problems in Africa, in the Middle East, in Russia, as he gives these speeches. And the problem that I have had is that the speeches have fallen short of reality. And it's not just that he hasn't had time yet, um, because he's taken a number of decisions that have just contradicted the, 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 the rhetoric. So for example, he promised us that he was going to close Guantanamo within a year. Now, I know it took longer than expected. That's not the issue. But it turns out that what he meant by closing Guantanamo was just the physical facility. He's going to keep the spirit of Guantanamo going and just move it to Thompson, Illinois, to a, a new prison that they're going to open up there. So he wants to keep military commissions, these dumbed-down tribunals where people do not get due process. Um, he wants to continue holding people without criminal charge or trial. The essence of Guantanamo, that's continuing. Or if you look at his speeches, you know, he, he, he went to the Middle East, he went to Cairo, and he talked about the importance of democracy. And here he distinguished himself from Bush. You may remember that Bush was for democracy until the wrong person won. And, and so, um, you know, Hamas won in the Palestinian territory, um, the Muslim Brotherhood did better than expected in Egypt, and suddenly Bush stopped talking about democracy. You know, Obama came in and said, I'm for democracy, and, and even, basically was suggesting even if the Muslim Brotherhood wins, we can live with that. So a very principled approach. But then 
he never pushed Mubarak to democratize. You know, Mubarak visited the White House and nobody said anything. He hasn't pushed the Saudi leadership to democratize. So pretty rhetoric, no reality to follow up. Um, in, in Africa, he would distinguish himself from Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton talked about these new African leaders and he embraced people like Paul Kagame in Rwanda or Melis Sinawi in Ethiopia. People who are helping their countries develop, they're smart, they're not corrupt, but they're incredibly authoritarian. They're moving in the wrong direction big time. Um, so Obama says Africa doesn't need strong men, it needs strong institutions. Very good point. It needs the rule of law, it needs free press, it needs civil society, independent judges. But then, you know, having made this pronouncement, he doesn't put any pressure on Kagame. He doesn't really push malice to reverse their authoritarian tendencies. And I could go on and on, but the real problem is, um, you know, these are, are decisions that were, they, they're the rhetoric that we have now, but it's not just a lack of personnel or a lack of time. He's actually decided right now not to follow through with the rhetoric. And, and so, you know, what we have to do is to kind of encourage him to live up to the ideals that he's articulating, because otherwise he's going to be seen as a president of, you know, of wonderful ideas, but empty rhetoric. But and I, I think I that that would be a real lost opportunity. Can, can I just come in? Because, yeah. because <laughs> <laughs> there, 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 there is something, there's something more subtle at work here, I mm -hmm. think, and it goes back to what the senator said. Uh, and it, he may not fulfill your agenda. He may not fulfill the green agenda. He may not fulfill an agenda that we here in, in Davos, in Switzerland, feel is the right agenda or this audience, the constituency represented by this audience. But what I think the electorate are starting to say, and I think we'll see it again in midterm unless there's a major course correction, and I disagree that the State of the Union message, from what I've seen of it so far, is that course correction, is that the American population or the American electorate is saying that they aren't quite as pop pop populist as the president interpreted they might be. I, I find it sort of, I, I, before I came to Davos on, uh, on Tuesday, I was, um, I don't know how the interpreter is going to interpret this word, discombobulated, disorientated by what happened on Thursday evening. I was sitting at home in the UK in London watching CNBC and I see the president get on the television, uh, deal with the proprietary trading uh, suggestion uh, to, to disenfranchise the banks, maybe rightly, of their proprietary trading. Barney Frank come on and say that might take three to five years. And by the way, the president used a phrase something along the lines of, you know, if there's a fight, we're ready for a fight or if we'll, we'll fight. I, I find that sort of extraordinary. It was almost lashing out at the, at the result in Massachusetts. We had the Supreme Court decision on lobbying, which is something also that he finds very difficult to accept. And then we had, of course, President Sarkozy's speech here in Davos uh, a few nights ago. This is quite sort of disorientating and, and a reversal of direction. From an economic policy point of view, Tim Geithner and Larry Summers seem to be pushed further into the background. Paul Volcker seems to be exercising uh, more influence. But I think the point is that exactly what the senator said, America is a country we cannot inject our thinking into the way that the Americans think. And I think American thinking is more centrist than where the president is. In exactly the same way, for example, and this may be something you don't like to hear, that you can't inject into China a Judeo-Christian approach, you know, the Google China debate. Don't judge China by your values and your rights. You have to look at China and issues of China, Human rights, China, freedom in China Thank through Chinese eyes. So I think, I think the, uh, the the basic point is America is much more centrist. Can, can we stay? Can, can, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. It's, it's very interesting. Stay on it's the hard. point. Yeah, stay it's hard. Point. It's hard for me to stop you because it's interesting. But uh, you're going to stop me anyway. <laughs> I don't agree, <laughs> I don't agree with what you just said now that uh, we have to look at, at China through Chinese eyes. I think on human rights. Many countries, not all countries in the world, have signed the Universal Declaration of, of uh, Human Rights. And like in, in rhetoric, say, yes, we agree, but they don't on the ground. So I think that's a basis and where also human rights activists in China refer to that. But I wanted to say something else before, uh, referring to what Ken Ross just said. I agree with all of the things you said, where he hasn't delivered, where he could have 
delivered already in this first year. But from a European point of view, there were some things that I appreciated very much that he did in this first year. For example, saying no to the, the rocket defense system that he wanted, that Bush, no, not him, Bush wanted to uh, settle down in, in Poland and the Czech Republic without these two Europe EU governments really adhering to what what the EU would have wanted and what even their people would have wanted, meaning not having that. Uh, so that was a big step for Europeans that he said no to that. The other thing that he, in a certain way, came back to multilateralism, multilateralism at the UN level, even <coughs> though many of us do not like exactly what's going on at the Human Rights uh, Council. But still, the US, for the first time taking part in that as a full member, is some progress if you defend the United Nations and want to improve them at many levels. For Guantanamo, I think there also, there's also a problem with the ones of, of us, like some many Europeans, who see ourselves as allies, haven't done enough also to support him in that. Yeah? Uh, my country, for example, Austria, has denied, no, we're not going to take anyone, yeah? not even the ones where it's clear they haven't committed anything. Yeah? So I think also from a European point of view, there also needs to be some more support in certain issues uh, for him and also to be able to deliver. And one last thing, I think his role is not just, and that's one of his big problems, for the US people, but it is something where we look at for change in other parts of the world as well. And that makes it so difficult for him. He cannot just look into domestic politics, yeah? but he has to in order to go on. But as Ken said, he has to but focus. What? He has to focus. Yeah, of course. Eine, eine Frage an Sie, Frau Senator. A uh, question to you, Madam Senator. Um, the State of the Nation address this week, you said that in the first year he made mistakes, he didn't respond to the needs of the people, he didn't really respond to the fear of unemployment, didn't focus enough on economy, and now it seems that there might be a change in direction. He's really emphasizing employment, creation of jobs. He's been quite forthright in his statements. Do you think that together with uh, the State of the Nation address that uh, this really does represent a change? Yes. It's too early to tell. It's going to depend on what the president puts forward now. There was a lot of good rhetoric in the State of the Union address, but nevertheless, when you look at the specifics, such as health care, he did not really indicate any willingness to work together to try to come up with a health care bill that would have broader support. It's clear to me that you could draft such a bill that would have broad support. It wouldn't go as far as the president wants, uh, but it would have broad bipartisan support. And the president took a couple of shots at people in that. The Supreme Court decision the Supreme Court justices do not always come to the State of the Union address. Oftentimes, just one will come. This time, for the President's first State of the U first real State of the Union address, virtually the entire court came. Now, I don't di agree with the Supreme Court's recent ruling on campaign financing either. But for the president to so directly chastise and criticize the court for that decision is unheard of. It is absolutely unheard of. And it was a sour note, it was inappropriate, and it's something that he should not have done. What he could have done is said to the Congress, I want to work with you to respond to the Supreme Court's decision. I don't agree with the decision. I want to work with you to figure out what we can do now. Instead, he gave a very harsh critique of the decision. And that, that's just not the right approach. You know, one other point, it is true that the president always loses seats from his party in the midterm elections. But what happened in Massachusetts is far beyond 
the usual loss of a few seats in the midterm election. This is Massachusetts, the most democratic state in the nation. This is Massachusetts, where the, the seat had been held for decades by Ted Kennedy. This is Massachusetts, which has a health care program that actually is similar in some aspects to what the president was proposing. But Massachusetts said no. This was an astonishing election. Und warum? Aber wa was ist die so what's your inter Hi. Why did they say no to the Democratic Party? I think that they believe that the president was not focusing on the issues that are causing struggles for the American family right now. The lack of jobs, the poor economy, and they felt that should have been his focus. I also believe that they felt that the health care bill was a divisive partisan bill that was uh, that included special deals for two states in order to get the votes of the senators representing those states and they were offended by both the process the behind closed doors negotiations and by the policies can you eine eine frage noch just one more question can you speak and explain to the audience here what the most contentious points were in this health care reform? We have a, um, a system in Switzerland with the universal insurance. That's um, an obligation under law. We have a problem, obviously, of uh, health care costs, just like any country in the world. But which particular points in the attempt at health care reform were the ones that actually stopped the bill getting through Congress, even though I believe they had a majority at the time, which means that the, not all Democrats were actually behind the reform? Why were they not behind it? What were the major stumbling blocks? This is a long answer, which I'll try to do very Sorry? quickly. First, uh, people who have insurance now in my country generally are happy with their insurance and they feared that the cost of the insurance would go up. And indeed, there were studies that showed that that was true. It did not mean that they are unsympathetic to those who do not have insurance and many of us believe we need to move towards universal coverage. Second, there was an insufficient focus on the cost of health care. That is the reason people are uninsured. That's the reason small businesses are terminating health insurance. That's the reason that middle-income families are struggling with the cost of health insurance. There was a feeling that this bill in the long run was going to be very expensive. The tax increases to pay for the bill started immediately, but the subsidies for low-income people to help them afford health insurance did not start for four years. So there was a mismatch that made people distrustful about what this bill ultimately was going to cost. The bill slashed the Medicare program. That's the program, the government program, that provides insurance for senior citizens and for the disabled. It cut $500 billion out of the Medicare program over the next 10 years, even though everyone knows that this program is underfunded and not financially solvent. So if there are savings to be made from the Medicare program, they should be invested back into the program, especially since my generation, the baby boom generation, will soon be retiring and the demands on that program will go sky high. And finally, there was a lot of concern about the way this bill was negotiated, not in public, but behind closed doors. Then when it came out and we were voting on Christmas Eve, we find out that there were all these special deals that were sneaked into the bill without deals that had there been a vote on them, like the special deals for Louisiana uh -huh. and Nebraska, would never have been approved, never. Okay. 
can, Christy, can thank I just, you. Can, thank can you. I just come back? Yes. Uh, and then back. we go to the, do, to the yeah, economy. But let me just, yeah, it's related to the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, the senator said in that that in, in yes, we can, it's the word we. There's another example going on here, I think, at the same time, that, that, that the president really hasn't included, and it's not a popular thing at the moment to include business in any agenda for the, for the reasons that we all know, the state of the world economy, the bankers, the bonuses, et cetera, and, the, and you know, using government money to bail them out, and then from the paying bonuses on the profits. But the interesting thing, it's really intriguing, I think, is that business has sort of been isolated in part, well, not in part, almost in whole from the Obama administration. There is no, and the senator can correct, correct me if I'm wrong, there is no businessman or woman, really, in the cabinet. Usually the Commerce Secretary would be a prominent businessman or businesswoman brought in. There is nothing. The, the President really hasn't made, with the exception probably of Eric Schmidt at Google, he hasn't made any great attempt to engage the business community in his program. So there's not a bipartisan approach in that sense too. Interestingly, David Cameron and the Conservatives in the UK have pursued exactly the same policy. Until recently, when they started to formulate their program, they haven't really engaged the business community. And there, there's a fundamental problem here that we in business have got to engage with, is that we trust uh, image, going back to your words, PR, it's not, it's not about gestures I'm sorry, and PR. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Genuine, you know, you've, hurt, <laughs> you've deeply offended me. Um, all, all, these, all these things are oh, terribly sorry. important. Business has to have more prominence, and we've got to engage more with the administrations, I think, on both sides of the Atlantic in a constructive way. And I think Davos, actually, this year, uh, I was my, in my disconcerted state when I came here on Tuesday. I leave Davos tomorrow probably feeling a little bit better that the bankers get it and that moves are afoot to bring those communities together. But it, the, the, we, the we that you pointed out before in, in a Republican versus Democrat sense, I think is also true in a business sense too. Yeah. Thank you. We have heard that the... Well, we've heard today that the numbers in the last quarter uh, were much better than expected. Perhaps uh, is it's a um, bit too early to let the champagne corks fly. But what's your interpretation? Uh, to what extent in the USA have the financial and economic crisis been left behind? I think it's very hard to, to really know the true picture because the trouble is that America has built so much on confidence as well. And um, it's, it's funny, I, I've, for example, currency fluctuations. I watched the, the pound dollar because I have a mother living in Britain and I tend to you know, have to change money for her. And I haven't never seen such huge changes um, you know, on such a short basis. It, it, it's, these are phenomenal changes in currency, and no one seems to be really sure about uh, the economy. I do think um, the difficulty with living in a city like Washington, D.C., where I'm based, or anyone living in any of the major cities, it's, it's a slightly distorted picture of what's going on, because I think a lot of the economic uh, stress is felt outside those cities. Um, these cities are you know, traditionally a lot stronger in terms of um, job opportunities and, and uh, job creation. Well, not necessarily job creation, although the Obama administration did bring in jobs, obviously, into D.C. with the change of administration. But I think that it's, it's very hard to tell, and, and the trouble is people act so much on short-term information, and they act, uh, uh, the confidence factor is huge. And I think that's, that's, uh, it's much harder to get a real picture of what's going on based on that. But the irony is that's what can really move the markets as well, the, is the confidence factor. Maybe something on that as well. I think you mentioned confidence factor, and that I think is that's the whole the whole symbolic part of, of Obama's administration and of his promises, and in politics of and in and in the economy even more maybe, uh, you need uh, symbols, but you need then the reality as well. Yeah, you need both. I mean, the good thing of Obama is that he has this symbolic level and and creating an atmosphere where people tend or, or are tempted to trust again. But on the other hand, like with the economy, uh, I think there, there are two, for me, there, there are two main factors where, where he still has to look into and, and come up to his promises. One was, um, this, or one is, the, the thing with regulating financial markets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were so much promises, even the G20, the G8, the G20, everybody promised and said, yes, we will do, and yes, we, we can, and yes, we will. <laughs> the problem is, they still talk about, yes, we can, but they don't do. And that Obama has to take a I mean, he tried now, he, trade with, he tried with the, what is it, bonuses, bony, bonuses? bonuses yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, now also with getting a, a tax, like on, on banks, yeah? But on regulating, for example, rating agencies, 
or having a, uh, th there's still ways, there's still lots of things to do to make people trust even in banks again. The issue of making banks again, either banks who are just here for um, the, the commercial banks and on, uh, others who do investment and not both, like, like Volker pr proposed. Yeah? I mean, these things have to be done in order that people can maybe understand that it made sense to put such lots of money in the banks. Yeah? Even in, that's the same in Europe. Um, and the other thing for me is uh, the, this, what I speak about and what he also spoke about, this Green New Deal. If we want the economy to get back on track, it cannot be done without taking the ecology and the environment into account. We are wasting too much, and the US more than others. Yeah? Um, the EU, EU, Europe, Switzerland also has to do lots. Yeah? Yeah. Everybody has yeah. to do, but the US has to do lots. And these promises are there, and there's lots of jobs in a green economy. And if he doesn't take on that, yeah? I mean, and, and the car industry, I know jobs are important, but if you don't put pressure on the car industry to go into hybrid cars, and on another level, go into, for example, having high-speed trains in the US, as far as I know, I mean, I don't know whether there are any, but really investing in that, that's ways to really also get the economy working again and make people trust that even young people can have a job in the future. Aber glauben Sie nicht? But don't you believe that in the USA the green economy is something which is seen as a factor of the economy rather than a factor of cost. Well, that hasn't happened yet, that change. It's kind of yes we could rather than yes we can. Just yeah. I think it's important to recognize that you know, Obama inherited some enormous problems. I mean, it's hard to imagine a president who has come in facing bigger difficulties not of his doing. Um, he had you know, a disastrous war in Iraq, a worsening problem in Afghanistan, an economy that was completely falling through the bottom, um, plus you know huge unmet problems such as health care and climate change. So he was facing a massive agenda. And whenever you tackle a problem of that magnitude, you face opposition. And, and that, unfortunately, is what he has encountered. You know, he dealt with the, the economy, with the job problem, with a huge stimulus bill, which was the right thing to do, but that has increased the deficit. And so people are saying, you're spending too much money. And at a point when he should actually be probably continuing the stimulus, people are saying, no, 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 time to cut back. Um, or, you know, he tries to tackle health care. And people say, well, not if it's going to increase the cost of my insurance policy, or not if there might be less money for Medicare. And so he gets, you know, new opposition there, even though he's trying to do the right thing by, by extending health care to everybody as, as, a, as a basic right. And, and you can just go, you know, down the, the, the line. I mean, everything he's doing, he's generating opposition. We, we take the banks. You know, he rightly sees that people are outraged that the banks, you know, speculate with other people's money. If they win, they keep the money and get a bonus. If they lose, they go to the government for a bailout. You know, I'll take that job, you know. Um, and, and so, and so, you know, but when he tries to tackle that, then he generates animosity from the business community. So, you know, you see, you know, all these little, you know, minorities that are opposed to him in one part of the agenda or the other. And, and it's difficult, you know, how do you maintain a governing majority when you're trying to do the right thing in all these areas, when everybody is, you know, kind of looking out for themselves in these small areas. So I, I feel for the guy. Um, he is, you know, I think he's probably got the most ambitious agenda of any president that we can remember in our lifetimes. But it is a tough job, and, and he may be taking on too much. I mean, that's the problem. He may be failing simply because of the magnitude of the problems before him. There also needs to be a change in mindset, because irrespective of politics and parties and so on, there's a basic mindset in America which uh, I discovered, which is being exported, um, sadly. And that is one of very heavy consumerism. And as you were saying about the need for a green uh, future, it, there's no need for people to be buying at the rate Americans do. And most of the stimulus seems to be around getting people to spend. And the danger is that people are, are buying, I mean, the amount of consumption is phenomenal. You buy an iPod, it's five gigabytes, the next day you've just un unwrapped it and they've got the 10 gig and you feel inadequate, though you never filled the five gig in the first place. And it's the cycle of, I'm, I'm inadequate unless I actually have the latest thing. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's, it's an art form, actually, but there needs to be a whole mindset um, for people to realize that, you know, you can buy a piece of furniture and keep it 20 years. It doesn't have to be the latest fashionable thing every five, you know, five years or change a car every three years. 
Um, and I think that's part of the problem is that we're, we're consuming at a phenomenal rate and it's and that, that sense of consumerism is an American export. But, but just in the longer term for a minute, because the, I mean, the irony is, as you pointed out, is that, that we spent and lent our way into a recession. Mm -hmm. And in order to get out of it, we're being told that we should spend <laughs> and lend to get our way out of it, <laughs> which is, is a little bit incongruous. But mm -hmm. there's a much more serious issue, much more serious issue. And that is, and it's difficult to say this, sit, sitting in, in a wealthy country like Switzerland, uh, in an extremely efficient, clean, uh, easy place to live. Um, but generally for the West, I think you have to put this in a historic continuum uh, and, in, and looking at the future. The simple fact of the matter is that we've consumed too much, as you say, and exchange for an ad man to say uh, that, that we've consumed too much, but more responsible consumption, a more responsible capitalism, a more respons moral, moral capitalism, as President Sarkozy was, was talking about, clearly is needed. But there's a much more fundamental issue. There's a shift in wealth taking place, which will mean not so much Switzerland, I think, because after all, Switzerland's wealth is dependent on these that's dependent to, much, to a great degree on these much maligned banks that you're talking about. But going beyond that, if we look at the United States, less so, but we look at Western Europe. I look at our, my own country of origin, the UK. If I look at France, if I like it, look at Germany, if I look at Italy, if I look at Spain, we have to face the fact that over the coming years, we will not be as successful as other countries in the world. And there is a significant shift in the balance of economic power, political, and social power as a result to the four countries that we often talk about, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, but also another group called the Next 11, which includes countries like Vietnam, Indonesia, Mexico, Turkey, South Africa is not included, but you, would, you should probably include that, Poland, and the like. So Asia, Latin America, Africa, and the Middle East are going to take uh, priority over the coming years. This is just back to the future stuff. Go back 200 years, China and India, amazingly, were 40% was of the worldwide GMP, which is where they will be, according to estimates and forecasts, by about 2040. This is something that I think is irreversible, but is very uncomfortable for us to do. And the underlining point is this. We have to consume less and save more. The Chinese and the Indians have to, have to invest less, save less, not invest less, save less, and consume more. Because we are going to depend increasingly mm -hmm. on their increased <coughs> consumption to get there. So it's the, and, and Obama, I, I've got to come back to it. Give him time. Mm -hmm. It's 12 months. The poor chap has had all these things to deal with, <laughs> and we're, we're, we're castigating him. Give him time. The problem is also 10% unemployment well. increasing is a very difficult thing to deal with and the unemployment issue. We've had a jobless recovery. Coming back to Christine's question about the economy, we see things less worse in the West. It's not really better. There's been a sequential GMP improvement, and with all due respect to the politicians on this stage, they jump on it when they see a sequential improvement and say, recession over. It's just less worse. The places where it's got better are Brazil, India, China, not so much Russia, and some of those next 11 countries. Thank you. Eine, thank you. Eine andere Frage. Wir müssen noch yes, we need to touch upon another issue. Uh, time is running away from us. I'd like to talk about the relationship with the Arab countries. There were expectations risen in the um, first year. The, we've already talked about the Cairo speech, but the peace process seems to have run aground in the Middle East, and there seems to be great disappointment. Can you give us a, you work in Al Jazeera, can you give us a summary from your perspective? Well, it's interesting. I, I spoke with uh, Queen Rania of Jordan today, uh, in the recording for my, my show for next week, and talked about the stagnation of the peace process. With all eyes on Afghanistan, A, Iraq has been forgotten, but the Middle East peace process is completely out of the window. Um, that's literally a ticking uh, bomb there. Um, so many people unemployed. I mean, it makes the problems of the West look, you know, trivial. The issue is that, um, again, it's a very difficult thing um, 
and I, I'm not one of these conspiracy theorists that, you know, the Jewish lobby does this and that. There is, there's an imbalance of, of treatment of various countries, but um, certainly from, from my perspective, one of the issues is that there's so much going on that the focus shifts from one to the other and no one follows through. Um, and it's kind of ironic because I work for Al Jazeera, which, you know, has, has had um, a strange reputation in the United States thanks to Donald Rumsfeld coming on all the time and, you know, calling us the voice of Osama and saying we, we show beheadings, which has never happened. Um, in fact, I tell Americans, you know, you just have to, the, the most fearful word in America right now is the. The. And that's because if you say it in Arabic, al, it's suddenly fearful. You had al-Aqsa, al-Qaeda, uh, al-Jazeera. <laughs> but of course, they have al Capone and al Gore. Um, <laughs> and they started it. <laughs> Um, now, now, fortunately, our problems have eased. But one thing that uh, Barack Obama did do, which, I, which I'm really pleased about, he's, he's reduced that culture of fear to some degree. Now, it, it doesn't help with, you know, having underwear bombers. It's so funny, a friend of mine going through the airport heard, an, oh, this is a while ago when we had the shoe bomber, Richard Reed, uh, heard an old man being asked to take his shoes off. And the old man was complaining, why do I have to take my shoes off? And the guy in front of him said, oh, well, ever since we had a shoe bomber, we have to take our shoes off. And my friend said, thank God we haven't had an underwear bomber yet. And, <laughs> And, of course, now we have. <laughs> um, but they're planning to look through our underwear rather than take them off. Um, the thing is that uh, he did reduce the culture of fear, which I think has been good. You know, words such as war on terror, or the expressions war on terror and so on, is much less in the vocabulary of America now. Um, and it doesn't help to have these incidents that raise the fear again. But essentially, that, that sort of constant creation of fear and, and your security. American TV is terrible to watch. You know, your, your security is threatened. Your, your life is in danger. There's constant uh, sense of fear uh, to keep people on the agenda, so to speak. I, I, in, Ki in Cairo, had Obama... In Cairo, uh, Obama extended his hand to the Muslim world. Was that offer accepted? I mean, I think there's, there's been huge hope. When you have a president who's, you know, Barack Hussein Obama, it kind of helps the Muslim world to say, well, look, you know, <laughs> he should be a bit more sympathetic. Um, the thing about it is, is that, uh, again, I think the, the agenda has been, on, certainly as far as the Israeli-Palestinian uh, Palestinian situation, which is, which is a key issue that needs to be resolved for everything else to be softened, um, has, has been let, let go. And I think that's one of the issues. Talking about surges in Afghanistan. Afghanistan, uh, you know, no one's going to fix Afghanistan in a couple of years. It's not going to happen. It's been going on for decades. Um, and uh, Iraq, again, is it's simmering away. Unless the, there's some focus on what's happening in, uh, in the, on, for the Israeli-Palestinian situation, and the Arab world is very disappointed because, of course, um, when, when Israel attacked Gaza, um, there was no real word from, a, uh, from Barack Obama for quite a long time. And there was a sense of, well, where is, where is this outrage at um, the death and destruction that we're seeing of a population that's, that's trapped in, a, in this tiny space? Um, it's, it's a difficult one. He, he's got a lot of political considerations to take on board, but I do feel that uh, the Middle East is disappointed he hasn't done a lot more in terms of finding some kind of resolution or pushing the Israeli-Palestinian resolution. Um, and, and I think that's going to be a, a, a dent, uh, dent for him. But there is hope, more so than there was uh, under George Bush and, and Dick Cheney. And, and es nicht einen Stopp jetzt auch in der but there hasn't been a stop in the settlement policy. They're still building. So even that hasn't been done. Can I ask you, um, what did Obama understand by robust diplomacy that he wanted to introduce in the Middle East? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I've been disappointed by his Middle East policy. We, we thought that he was going to really open a new chapter. He appointed George Mitchell, um, a very respected former senator, as his mediator. And this is a, a skillful man who, who helped um, build peace in Northern Ireland. And, and we hoped that Obama would back him with a policy that really did begin to build the trust needed between Israelis and Palestinians so they could finally conclude a peace agreement. But there have been two big areas where Obama has disappointed. Um, one, as you mentioned, Christine, is on, on the question of the settlements, where you know, Obama rightly recognized that the Palestinians are, um, are, are furious by Israel's continued building of settlements on occupied land. And Obama said, you know, I'm going to insist that you stop. And Netanyahu said, no. And Obama said, okay. <laughs> you know, and, and, and Netanyahu came back with sort of, you know, a half-assed, you know, sort of compromise that, that, you know, the U.S. just is living with. So basically the settlements are continuing. The other big problem is that both Hamas and the Israelis have continued to kill each other's civilians. You can argue about the degree of intentionality, um, Hamas is continuing to launch rockets 
et cetera, out deliberately trying to kill civilians. You know, they haven't killed more just because it's very difficult to aim the rockets. Um, the Israelis, um, during the war of, of a year ago in Gaza, um, undertook a number of policies that were just clear war crimes. Um, you know, deliberately dropping white phosphorus over populated areas. Um, something, this is something that burns civilians, buildings, whatever. It should never be used in populated areas. Using heavy artillery in populated areas. Again, killing many more civilians than necessary. Destroying massive amounts of civilian infrastructure with no legitimate military purpose. Now, um, Obama had an opportunity to address this. And, and we've already talked about the U.S. government's decision, Obama's decision, to join the U.N. Human Rights Council, which meets in Geneva. And that was a very good move. It was an effort to kind of take a more multilateral approach to the world. But one of the most important things to come out of the Human Rights Council in the past year was a report on the Gaza War by the South African jurist Richard Goldstone, a very respected individual who issued a report that was very fair. It looked at both sides. In fact, it was the first time the Human Rights Council had ever critically reported on an adversary of Israel. You know, they love to condemn Israel, but they never report on Hamas or Hezbollah. This one reported critically on Hamas. And it was a real opportunity to push both sides to bring their war criminals to justice. But the Obama administration just dismissed it summarily right at the beginning. Um, in fact, Susan Rice, the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., said, oh, first we want to get peace, then we'll deal with the war crimes. And she has it completely backwards, because you're never going to get peace so long as the Israelis and the Palestinians are shooting at each other's civilians. And the only way to end that is to end the impunity, to end the fact that they can get away with murder with no consequences. So you've got to build confidence between the two by stopping the war crimes, by bringing the war criminals to justice, and then you can begin productive talks toward the peace that we all want. And until Obama has the courage to stand up to those who are defending Israel regardless, and to say we are going to push for war crimes prosecutions, even if that implicates some Israeli leaders, we're not going to get to where we all hope to go in the peace mm -hmm. process. Thank you. Uh, Senator, an assessment from you, perhaps. Do you think that the relationship uh, between the U.S. and the Arab world has been able to become more relaxed thanks to Obama? I believe the president deserves a lot of praise for reaching out to the Arab world. I thought his speech in Egypt was an attempt to to truly reach out to Muslims in particular. And George Mitchell's from the state of Maine. Uh, he is a former Maine senator. He is half Lebanese. And I think that that was a good appointment. Look, the issues involving the Middle East are going to take time. And we've, we've talked in the beginning about whether one year uh, was a fair amount of time by which to judge President Obama. I believe it is certainly not a fair amount of time to judge the progress towards Middle East peace. Thank you. Well, it has to be very quick because I'm going to give the floor to the audience. I wanted to add and to take the freedom to the economic dis uh, discussion. If we don't take this opportunity of the opportunity of this economic crisis to add other indicators to GDP growth, meaning like human development index or ecological footprint, then we will have a problem in the long run, not just a moral one, but an economic one as well. And just to the issue with the relation to the Arab world, I think Obama's notion of promising a partnership with respect is one that has opened doors. The question here is also how to deliver. Yeah? For the Middle East, I was very surprised that he had first said uh, Israel has to stop settlements. And then Hillary Clinton said, it's okay, they can go on. Yeah? I felt, I mean, why does that need to happen? Yeah? Can't they have one line and stick mm -hmm. to that? And hopefully that will continue. Um, I'm also afraid that the, the Nobel Peace Prize didn't really help as much as it should have. Yeah, I but that's, I mean, it's a different story. Can I take an Well, on the Nobel Peace Prize, I'd like to come back to that in the last round. The problem is soldiers won't solve the situation or the problem. Soldiers are not the solution. You might need them once in a while, but if you 
what is needed also to decrease the number of young men going to the Taliban is a perspective in their lives. Yeah? There are studies that 90% of the young recruits going to the Taliban don't do that because of ideological reasons. They do it because they promise them schools, they promise them an income and all these things. Yeah? So the focus really has to be on civilian uh, interventions, yeah? mm -hmm. meaning schools, meaning economic things. And I know that's problematic. It's easy to talk from here, I know. But it has to go towards that direction. Thank you. Well, I'd like perhaps to put a question to you, and um, if you have a question in the audience for Senator Collins, then please put that first because she has to leave us a little bit early. So, who would like to put a question? Yes, sir, in the first row here. It's working? Okay. Thank you. I have just a question to the senator. Um, we in rural Europe, we are really confused with your um, rules, the Philip Booster rule. We cannot understand it that you need in the Senate a majority of 60 vote because in Europe it's 50 plus one, it's a vote, and that's the majority, and you have to exact what the uh, people vote. And if they vote and we want the Senate with 55 Senates, it's for me um, a majority. Is it the possibility because you are I know every, every party, also the Democrats, before blocked every law of Bush. It's a pos uh, possibility to change this Philly Booster law. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, for those who may not be familiar with the filibuster rule in the Senate, the Senate, by tradition, in proceeding to bills, operates by unanimous consent. That means that a single senator of the 100 senators is able to block action unless there is a vote. There are many, many things that happen by unanimous consent or by a majority vote. But on large contentious legislation, it generally takes 60 votes because under our rules, um, you have to achieve that supermajority in order to proceed to the bill, to proceed to votes on the bill. I do not support doing away with the filibuster rule. There was an attempt by my party to do away with it when judicial <laughs> nominees were being blocked in the last administration, and there's an effort underway now by the Democratic Party to do away with it. Uh, because of unhappiness about the health care bill. I think the fact that the party in power always tries to do away with it tells you something about the value of the rule. Now, the House of Representatives has only the simple majority rule. The Senate is intended to be the more deliberative body. It is intended to be the body where the rights of the minority are respected, and we do not have a parliamentarian system. We have a representative government system. We do not have a system where party discipline is such uh, that everyone, as, th as was implied earlier, uh, everyone in one party always votes with the party. Uh, I have one of the higher levels in my party of supporting bipartisan initiatives and supporting uh, the president. So I think this system has served us well. It came about through history when the Senate was created. Uh, there was a debate among our founding fathers, and it was said that the Senate was to be the saucer for the tea, the hot tea, that the House of Representatives sent over. And the role of the Senate was just as you might pour some tea from the cup into the saucer to cool it, was to take a more deliberative approach to the issues. Over the years, I believe it served us well, and I don't think it's going to be changed, even though there is an effort underway to do so. Thank you. Weitere Fragen? Any more questions? Uh, hello, I'm Bruno Marischal from the International School of Geneva. 
And uh, as Mr. Mr. Sorrell said, uh, we will not get out of the crisis by lending and spending on the same thing we spent the last 10 years. And I was wondering what did Mr. Obama did when he said, yes, we can. Do you think he, he is able to, to change the economy in terms of technology and energy? Do you think we can, the United States can and the world can change uh, the direction of the economy and remove the lobbies? Okay. Um, difficult question, but I'll have a go. Um, I, I, think, I think the way out for Western Europe is um, extremely tough. I mean, I think the world is uh, developing at different speeds, and there are three, broadly, three different levels. Uh, I'm much more optimistic and much more hopeful about the BRICS, what I describe as the BRICS, and or others have described as the BRICS and Next 11. Uh, I'm very pessimistic about Western Europe. Um, the ability that we have to change our economic structure, often in very painful ways, uh, and retrain, re-educate, adapt. Mobility is not something in Western Europe that, is, uh, that we see in America. Now, if you think about the numbers for a minute, the, wor the world's economy is about $65 trillion, the, the GMP, whether that's the right index, whether we should have happiness indexes, or indices or not, or eco ecological indices or whatever. Uh, let's put that to one side for a minute. But the, the, the GMP is about $65 trillion. America is about $14 trillion. It's massive. The next biggest economy in the world is still Japan at about 4.9. China's about 4.5, but China will overtake Japan this year. And the five Western European economies, think of them as two to three trillion dollar economies. Germany's about three and a half trillion. Um, America, because of its size, uh, because of its natural resources, because of its human resources, the 300 million people in America who are broad, they are different, obviously, north, south, east, west, Hispanic, Afro-American, but it's, it is a melting pot. The diversity, the, the power of immigrant <coughs> talent and entrepreneurship. Never underestimate America. In the 80s, they underestimated America. They said Japan was going to take over the world. It didn't happen. Along came President Reagan. We might laugh at that a little bit, but don't laugh because he did. He reversed you know, a, a pessimism then and was extremely effective. And he, interestingly, his style was one of delegation. His style was to hire good people, surround himself with good people, he was a great communicator, and he was very effective. So I would say, in answer to your question, you know, this, this has been mentioned about the environmental threat, the environmental problem. If you talk to people, and there are plenty here in Davos at the, at the World Economic Forum, who are in Silicon Valley, in venture capital, in the technology companies. They have never witnessed, if you talk to them, the amount of effort, investment, thinking around the whole environmental area. If you look at the Chinese, uh, you know, Tom Friedman's book, second book, I guess, after, after The World is Flat, or the major book after The World is Flat, TV programs, talks about China being one of the envir environmental pioneers. It might, might, might sound strange to say that, but they are in the forefront, whether we like it or not, in a number of major environmental uh, dealing with the challenges. I think America will reassert itself, but I just want to come back to one point in relation to, to the Middle East. One of the things, that the, the moral position of America, I think, in a world stage, was undermined during the Bush administration. Uh, it was very difficult, and Obama has improved the image of America by light years. We, we, we see it in the data, data. Whatever the comments about policy in the Middle East or whatever, America's image is much stronger under Obama, even after a year, than it was under the Bush administration. One of the problems he has to deal with, however, I was in Riyadh. I went there for the first time. Where? And, and one of the things was the Arabs won't listen to the Americans like they used to because we messed up. We in the West messed up the economy, and the Chinese and the Russians, we, we saw that last year in, in Davos with Putin, with what President Putin, uh, Prime Minister Putin said, what 
President Lula has said in the context of Brazil, Thank you. we messed up. Anyway, Thank sorry. You. sorry. Sorry. Thank you. We need more questions. There is. Yes. Oh. Thank you very much. Maybe if, if you could be a little bit shorter with the oh, answers, so I'm so sorry, then, um, then we could have more questions. She said we could talk about it when she's gone. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, just um, one short question. Just a, um, a question that, yes, we can, this change campaign, is it, is it supposed to be understood as an appeal on optimism to make the world a better place, or is it rather an order to join this group of dynamic that we see, that you rather join us or not by having Obama as a man of peace right now? Who do, who do you want to answer? It's so open to anyone who... I, th I think it, like it was meant as, as an optimistic vision, that there are big problems in the world, but we can tackle them. You know, the, the naysaying of the past can be rejected, that if you have the, the appropriate will and energy and spirit, you can get things done. I think it was as simple as that, and people responded to it. I think it also got people interested in politics who for long, especially young ones, who, who, were, who were brought up with the idea of politics is somewhere in Washington or somewhere else, but not with them. I think that was the we part of it as well. Yeah. Probably. It, it's, wor it, it's working. Okay. It's working, okay. yes. I'm uh, Yoshi Marcel from the uh, University of Tokyo, Japan. Probably this is a question for Mr. Roth. Okay, what would the U.S. have been different if uh, McCain had been elected? <laughs> um, well, yeah, I mean, I, I think, yeah, it's, um, <laughs> it's hard, you know, it's hard to imagine. I, I think, you know, the, the, I mean, the biggest difference, I mean, Martin alluded to this, uh, the, you know, the Obama came into office at a point where America's reputation was at an all-time low. Um, and, and this had largely to do with Bush's unilateralism, you know, his arrogance, his decision to fight terrorism without regard to international law or human rights. I mean, there were a series of things where people just saw Bush as going it alone and resented that. Now, um, you know, McCain is a much more worldly man. And in certain respects, um, you know, is a significant, would have been a significant improvement from Bush. I mean, you can see that even um, while you know, before he ran for president, um, McCain was the principal sponsor of legislation trying to end Bush's torture. Um, and, and of course, McCain, you know, is a personal victim of torture and believes very much in this. But then, you know, even McCain um, had, had limits. You know, today he is, I think, on the wrong side of Guantanamo. And I don't see McCain even articulating the vision that Obama has articulated in places like Accra or Cairo or Shanghai or, or Moscow. Um, he, he did not run a campaign of ideas, which I think is part of why he didn't electrify the American public the way Obama did. Um, you know, our, our problem with Obama is not the lack of ideas, not the lack of vision, but so far the lack of consistent implementation. You, and you forgot about Thank one you. thing, and Thank that's Sarah Palin. Oh, well, yeah, we had Sarah oh, yeah. Palin as well. Yeah. Which was, you know, <laughs> you know big mistake. Yeah. You, <laughs> that's the other want, half you of don't the want an answer. We don't have to go I, there. Yeah. I, would like to know, I would like to know, Riz, how you would have answered that question. Um, I, you know, it's very hard to imagine. One thing I do know that uh, I think that, that may not have happened is this, this sense of inclusion. Uh, I think this idea of yes, we can was this idea that, you know, people are together. Um, one thing that seemed, we certainly felt it in the media is that under George Bush there was a lot of negative stereotyping, there was a lot of exclusion, us and them, and he even came in saying you're either with us or against us. I think that, um, I don't know how much that would have stayed under McCain, but certainly Obama has tried to change that, I think, and, and just because of who he is and being so different has created a sense of, um, you know, inclusion. Uh, and in the negative perceptions are, are interesting, and I always illustrate it with the story of uh, a man who um, was walking through Central Park and an elderly lady was attacked by a dog. And this man, young man, saw it, and he shooed off the dog. And this uh, local newspaper reporter in New York uh, found this guy. And he said, listen, I want to do a story on you saving that uh, elderly lady from that dog. Uh, I can see the headline now. Local hero saves woman from dog attack. So the guy said, well, I I'm actually not from New York. You know? He says, no, no, no problem. I can see the headline now. American hero saves pensioner from dog attack. He said, actually, I'm just visiting here. I'm from the Middle East. And the headline next day was, local dog attacked by Arab terrorist. So, <laughs> so I think, I think, 
<laughs> Some of the perceptions changed. Frontman, <laughs> I'm living in Europe in uh, many, uh, well, few of the countries, and uh, and uh, working now in Germany. And I was happy with my friends that Obama has won the election. Now the news are turning very negative around him, or objective, but more and more negative. Um, what do you think? Who will be the first? turning back and saying, well, Obama, he's going to make it. Which organization or which party maybe or what person will maybe change the news about well, Obama? Well, the media is fickle, by the way. The media is very, media is very fickle. So I think the media will go where they think everyone else is going, I'm sad to say. Um, so the media just goes on what the politicians but, say and, you know, so I, I think... Riz, you as an anchor. I know, I'm no, sorry. So, well, I'm just... Disappointed. No, it's sad, no, it's, but sad, you're right. it's sad. We have knee-jerk <laughs> reactions. You, you know well, Riz, that once you've written the negative story, the only story to write is the positive That's story. True. So, That's true. so the gentleman's question is probably relevant. I, I, one observation I think was remarkable in the last 12 months is the people who were strong supporters of Obama have changed their view. That's extraordinary. I mean, the, the sort of although it's wrong to judge him after 12 months, it's amazing who people who really supported him, either financially or morally or psychologically, really changed. Is, is this really too fast uh, on walk yet? Well, it's almost fashionable. It's almost fashionable to uh, criticize Obama at the moment. Um, first, so first of all, you built him up, and now it seems only time to knock him down. Is that what's happening? We do that, particularly in the UK. You know, we, we built, people get built up and then they get knocked down. We're, we're very professional, professional at doing that. Um, I, I, I don't know whether I'd agree with that, but it is remarkable. I mean, I know, know one or two people who were very involved in the campaign and they have changed their view. It can change on a sixpence, but I don't think it's a question about sort of some magical media uh, manipulation. It's about action. And I think just what was said, what Ken just said was really important. He's a brilliant strategist. We all know if you even have the best strategy in the world, as somebody said earlier today, you know, it's one-tenth strategy and nine-tenths implementation, or implementation, implementation, implementation. He's got to make some decisions and implement Focus was what Ken said as well, which I'd agree with. You know, pick, pick your territory, make the decision, implement it, and then move on to the next. Yeah, perhaps one more thing. I'm not afraid that he won't make it. I believe he will be able to do a lot. That's the way that things are in politics. The efforts that follow the revolution. I do believe he has the chance to do a great deal, and I hope that he will do so. There was a woman who um, had her hand up. Anna Lintovska, Salzburg Global Seminar. My question is about uh, the future of transatlantic relationship. Uh, and my question is uh, whether America needs Europe as a partner, uh, and with the global shift of power to Asia, should we get accustomed to the idea that all major global problems will be solved by the U.S. and China. Could, let me, could I try that? Yeah. Um, and, and let me answer this. I realize Switzerland is not part of the European Union, so um, you know, I, I wish you were. They could use your help. But, um, but the, there's a real problem with the European Union. I actually think that the world needs Europe to be a more important voice. Um, and the problem that we've encountered over and over is that it takes the now 27 nations of the European Union so long to come up with a common position that there are, are two big problems with it. I mean, one is that it tends toward the lowest common denominator. So it tends toward mush, toward, you know, toward really not strong policy. And second, it kind of uses up all the diplomatic skills of, of European officials to negotiate among themselves that they have very little energy or ability, frankly, to negotiate with the rest of the world and to be a real interlocutor with the rest of the world. And so Europe has to find a way to develop common positions that doesn't require unanimity. The Lisbon Treaty was a step in the right direction. We'll have to see how it's implemented. But it, Europe, if it's going to really punch at its weight rather than way below its weight, which is the way it's been so far, it has to be able to go with, with a critical mass as consensus, you know, with, with, with some majority or slightly more than a majority, but not unanimity. If you leave you know, if you leave Europe's position to the weakest link, you will have a weak Europe. And that will leave the rest of the world to the United States and China. And, and frankly, we need Europe in that mix. So I hope 
that the reform effort that was begun by Lisbon, that was by no means ended by Lisbon, I hope that continues and that a stronger, more cohesive, but quicker and more flexible Europe emerges from that process. Thank you very much for these words. <laughs> it comes as Europa politician, yeah. as, as a member of the European Parliament now, and I was a member of the national parliament before for 10 years. Uh, but I really, I mean, I, I would like the EU so much, and I would like Switzerland to be part of it as well. But anyway, I would like the EU so much to speak, especially in foreign policy, with one voice. <laughs> the Lisbon Treaty is a chance, yeah? Having Ms. Ashton, Baroness Ashton now, as the new High Representative Vice Commissioner, I hope she will do that. I mean, from the hearings we had in the European Parliament, we were a bit disappointed about her not pushing forward on really say, telling the 27 foreign ministers, it's me, it's us, it's our common Europe to lead this common Europe, and not you and you and you doing whatever you want in your national foreign well, policies. Why didn't we take the opportunity to have a stronger leader that and foreign secretary? We had a big the opportunity. Problem, yeah, but that's the problem still of the construction of the EU with national governments deciding who these people are going to be. So, yeah? so who conspired? Was it a Franco-German conspiracy or what? No, it was different. <laughs> I mean, all of the na none of the national governments want, or hardly anyone wants, a strong European Union that sometimes tell them, we're not going to do what you want. It was an Irish that's the issue. conspiracy, as I recall. Whatever. A <laughs> it, it's not a conspiracy. That's the way the EU still works. The Lisbon Treaty makes it better. The European Parliament will have more to say. And there's a big majority in the European Parliament over over party lines that wants a stronger Europe. Also, to what you have asked, yeah, how, to, how to deal with EU transatlantic relations. I think it's so important to have a strong Europe, to be partners with the US when it's necessary, but also to criticize the US as other countries. And I mean, in, in a partnership, in a friendship, it's important to be able to criticize each other yeah, and not always to follow behind what the others are doing. Yeah? So that's the struggle I'm, I'm leading as well and many of us in the European Parliament. I hope we will succeed. Weit. Wir haben noch so viele. Da Hallo. Steht eine Frage. Hallo. Mein Name ist Hüfer. My name is Hüfer. I belong to uh, the Conrad Adenauer Foundation. What I'm interested by are the preconditions for success for Obama. What are the practical steps that we haven't seen yet? which need to be taken by Barack Obama so that he still has a chance of achieving this success. So what are the practical steps, quite practically step one, step two, and step three? Well, I'm sure the president himself would like to know that. Um, who can answer that question? I'll just take a, a little crack at it. Just, it's, it's, he's basically going down a, a very fast-flowing river, and the current's strong. And as much as he's working the... Uh, the till to try to steer it. I think it's just, you know, it's very tough for him. As long as he can hang on and, and the thing doesn't capsize, you know, it's really a case of getting into calmer waters. But he inherited so much uh, that is difficult. That, that uh, river is turbulent because of what he inherited. It's not like he started out quietly and then, you know, found his way into turbulent rivers, uh, into turbulent waters. And so I think it's him having to hang on and people starting to have some confidence and not expect overnight cures, really. One more question. There was a young man just behind you there. Yeah, it's what I just last about the Jugend geben. So I wanted to give the last uh, chance to speak to somebody young. Uh, have we any young motivated people in the audience? No, don't force anybody to speak. Please uh, pass the microphone on. He had his hand up. Uh, now he's changed his mind. Another young person. <laughs> A girl. Stephanie Morangello, I'm from the International School of Geneva. This is a question for Mr. Sorrell. I was just wondering, given um, the current economic um, well, condition, what do you think of Obama's move towards um, disenfranchising the, um, the banks? I mean, if the um, financial crisis came out of um, yeah. the overextension of credit, right then how, like, what is the relation? Okay, um, have a go. And uh, just, just one thing in the previous question. I, I think it's jobs, jobs, jobs. So, so getting the economy, uh, getting the unemployment rate under control, because what we've had is a cost-driven improvement. Companies 
improving their profits by cutting their costs, therefore cutting people. So those fourth quarter GMP figures are important in the context of that, although there must be some form of inventory correction in that, which if you correct for it, the numbers say it's not 5.7, it's about 2.2. So it's that, is I, I think, is the critical issue. On the banks, uh, I mean, I, I do go away from Davos tomorrow feeling a little bit better. I don't think, frankly, uh, and the, a lot of the sessions here, well, many of the sessions at Davos are Chatham House rules, which means uh, you can't really refer, refer to them, or certainly not directly, but I think the view was that the banks still brought, I mean, this is a broad statement, that the view broadly was that banks didn't get it and that uh, they didn't really understand the vehemence that they saw on Thursday night, the Thursday before Davos started from President Obama, or that we heard from Sarkozy, President Sarkozy, it was a very passionate speech, a uh, very emotional speech in many senses, there was a lot of rhetoric in it. Uh, it but, but having said that, uh, I think what is likely to happen that we'll see emerging in the next few weeks, few months, a, a, a system of regulation, increasing the capital bases and strength of the banks, and some limiting of their of their operations in relation to proprietary trading was the one that, that Obama focused on, which deals with or attempts to deal with the too big to fail issue. And uh, if you go back in time to the Great Depression of 1929, when the Glass-Steagall Act came into place afterwards, it's a similar, I think, situation. We had 10 years of regulation. So I think um, what will happen is the scale of banks will be limited. They will not be broken up completely, but I think they will be restructured uh, and the commercial part of the bank from the invest will be separated increasingly from the investment banking part. And I think actually Davos is prepared, uh, it's early to say this, I think, but I will say it. I think da Davos actually this year has played an important role in getting that uh, up on the agenda. It, it's sad. I mean, maybe it's just because I'm a journalist, I'm expected to be a bit skeptical. But a change of government um, in, you know, in a country like America, it's, people have to have money to be in government in the first place. So it's not like Europe where people can rise up from the, you know, the street to become politicians and decision makers. People have to have money in America. So I always think of a change of government a bit like a story of a, an ancient, one of these old galleons, a pirate galleon, um, you know, an Italian pirate galleon hundreds of years ago where the captain called all the men together and he said, I've got a good news and I've got a bad news. First, the good news. After three months at sea, we're going to have our first change of underwear. And all the people are, oh, thank God, change of underwear. He says, now the bad news. Luigi, you change with Enrico. Enrico, you change. <laughs> and, and it's a bit like dirty underwear going around a little bit. Maybe I'm a cynic, though. That sounds great. Ich werde zum, zum Schluss Ihnen jetzt alle. Well, to close, uh, I'll just put one question to all of you. You have a major challenge um, ahead of you. I'm going to give you 30 seconds, but I'm sure, yes, you can answer this question. Let me begin with you, Riz. Do you believe that the Nobel Peace Prize has harmed or benefited Obama? I, well, you know what? I still think the jury's a little bit out. I think it was premature. Um, and it was, it was a chance for him to try to, to prove himself. I think it was meant to bolster him, but there was too much cynicism because it came at a time when people were questioning him. Had he done a bit more, they'd have said it was deserved. But because he hadn't had a chance to do much, I think it was a bit premature. I think so far, it's still the jury's out. In the long run, I think he'll be positively mm -hmm. judged. Thank you. Auch ganz kurz von also very briefly. I mean, I think, you know, not only was it premature and that he hadn't done anything yet, but I actually, um, I do think it hurt him because it's seen as a European endorsement. And, and going back to, to Martin's um, statement earlier, America is a very conservative nation. And, and you may remember John Kerry, who was painted as being too French, and that worked against him. I, I think that you know, for Oslo to be conveying this award on a president who hadn't done much made it look like he was Europe's president, not America's president. And that's not what he needed at a time when he was tackling such difficult problems. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't have anything to add on that, and I will take the freedom to answer the one question the, the man back there said about what Obama... 30 seconds. Yeah, 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 yeah just shortly. <laughs> okay. One thing that Obama really should be doing, one thing I think that would really convince people that it's important, energy efficiency, investing in, in insulation of houses, of buildings, where you save on energy, in heating, and where you have jobs in the long run. I think that will help, would help a lot. Thank you. Thank you. No, I, I, I agree with what was said. I, if there was a Nobel Prize for vision, for strategy, 
I think I think it was right. I, I don't know, it, it, Ken. Do you know whether he has to agree to accept it? Was he given the option to accept it or not? Well, it, it would have been too obnoxious to reject it. You know, okay. so that wasn't a real option. But well, I, I, I actually think it might have been obnoxious short term. But I think I think actually he would have been well advised to say, look, not now. He gave a brilliant speech in Oslo, as yeah, you would expect. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> But, but I think it, he would have been well advised because there are people who have done momentous things who haven't had a Nobel Prize. I think it's up to him to do momentous prize. And i just finish by saying, you know, yes, we can, yes, we will. I, I think we should modify it after a year and we say, yes, we can in time. And yes, we will in time. <laughs> Thank you very much. So... Warm thanks to you. Thank you very much, Riz Khan. Ken Roth, Rebecca Lulacek, Martin Sorrell. Thank you very much to all of you. And the next uh, discussion is at seven, a world without nuclear weapons. We will have the German defense minister. And if you could uh, leave the room room. Before that, please don't wait until, until 7. Uh, be back in time for 7 if you want to come for that discussion. Thank you very much for being here. I wish you a pleasant evening.